Giovanni Bellini's painting of St. Francis is a very remarkable picture for a number of reasons. It is a wonderful demonstration of Bellini's ability. He would have been aged about 45 at this time. It's also a landmark painting in the uh, development of the Venetian Baroque. And it also constitutes a enigmatic approach to the subject matter, which by then had a substantial tradition of representation. I've been studying and thinking about this wonderful painting now for well over 12 years and all the academic research I've come across is, to say the least, unimpressive. In fact, some of it, in the effort to find uh, the sort of true subject matter of the painting, the answer to the enigma, um, is either contradictory, incompetent, or just downright wrong. I feel the main reason for this is that in almost every account I can remember reading, the academics, the art critics, the historians concentrate on their obsession with symbolism and iconography at the expense of the almost total neglect of the artist's intention in the compositional order in the painting. For example, in all the reading and all the research I've done, I can't remember a single instance of a writer pointing out the importance of the bottom right, top left diagonal. It's this diagonal which is the major feature of the composition and supports all the other aspects of it, but it's clearly been overlooked for the most part. My feeling is that academics and art historians, critics and so on, don't see this sort of thing. First of all, because they are fixated on listing iconography. Ironically, because of this, they miss any symbolism which may be geometrically based or metaphorically based rather than simply just depiction based. It's true that the major enigma or puzzle of the painting of St. Francis is deciding in what the subject matter might be. But there are other difficulties too, one of which is the absence of the top edge of the picture at some stage is quite clearly being cut. And it wouldn't be much help to try and resolve this by reference to symbolism alone. No one that I've come across has attempted to answer this question by compositional analysis. But I have. And what is more, I've come up with an objective conclusion which is perfectly consistent with the work done by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2010 on the painting looking at x-rays, looking at chemical analysis, pigment and structural analysis of the panels and the way they were put together. The conclusion reached by the Met was that the painting had been cut by a few centimetres at most. And I'm quoting. My conclusion suggests that what's missing at the top edge of the painting is 1.6 centimetres. And those two things are perfectly compatible. So how did I get to that? The more I looked at the picture, the more interested I became in the arrangement in the bottom right hand quarter of the painting, in fact the nearest to the spectator. Not only was I interested in that arrangement, but particularly in the relationship between the position of St. Francis and the things behind him. This image is to scale and in proportion. The solid line, the continuous line that we see, represents the picture as we know it. The broken line at the top represents the top edge that I think was the original shape of the picture. I noticed that the position of the saint in relation to those things behind him was a little odd. It's odd in the sense that there is no thematic reason and no naturalistic reason why the saint should be standing effectively in the same plane or in a parallel plane to those objects behind him, the lectern, the book, the seat, the wall, and a number of other small examples, not just behind, but in the case of the wall and the steps here, and in the case of um, some sloping roofs in the background, picking up this general um, diagonal 
angle. Because of this strange thing, I decided to find out what it would look like if I were to abstract those directions simply as diagonal lines from the objects that they were based on and see how it looked in relation to the position of the saint. And therefore, this is why we have this, this diagram. This is the result. Now, allowing for the fact that you have to accept a certain degree of tolerance, this is a natural scene, not a mechanical or an architectural one. But what I thought I would do next would be to see what it looked like if I were to extend those diagonal angles. And this is the result. This is the self-same diagram, except with those angles which you saw in the previous one, extended or produced, I think is the correct geometric term. We can now see that these angles represent a kind of diagrammatic or schematic series of rays of light. It's quite clear, looking at the picture, that St. Francis is looking at something. We don't know what it is because there isn't anything in his line of sight to tell us. So perhaps he's looking at something which is actually beyond the picture. Not only do these extensions of the diagonals, as it were, represent a, a, a schematic uh, a set of uh, light rays, we know that light is falling on the same, not only do they do that, but they also simultaneously follow the direction of the landscape. And if you look at the painting, these lines move out of the picture at approximately the same place where the landscape does too. My contention is that there may be a geometric basis for understanding the subject of the painting just as much as there is a symbolic one. If we accept that a series of related directions emanating from the simple belongings, circumstances and surrounding of St. Francis' life of devotion point towards and imply a development shared simultaneously through the saint and the natural landscape, and further imply at least a general convergence, and if we also accept that St. Francis is seen gazing upwards in a similar direction, but that that towards which he gazes is not present in the picture, this suggests a possible connection between the two, the point of convergence and the focus of St. Francis' gaze. And this is what happens. A remarkably specific point of convergence at a position consistent with the saint's stare. And equally remarkable, this point marks the corner of a golden rectangle, the sides therefore being in the ratio 1 is to 1.618. Having observed Bellini's use of a square as a starting point, the golden rectangle is, as it were, a natural progression. Thus Bellini has given us a wonderful compositional allegory, a grand structural metaphor for the devoted life of St. Francis confirmed in the stigmatization, but without evoking any supernatural imagery. A marvellous reciprocal design, where the aim is also the source, from earthly life seeking the divinity, and from the divinity back to the saint. But why should the corner of the rectangle be identified with the divinity? Because that point establishes the difference between the two sides, and is thus the very arbitrament, the pivot, the determinant of the golden ratio of those lengths. Perhaps, you may say, this is all coincidence, but consider this. Working in Venice in the last decades of the 15th century, as well as Bellini, was the mathematician Luca Pacioli. Pacioli was a Franciscan and was involved in the publication of treatises by Piero della Francesca. In 1509, Pacioli published his own treatise on the golden ratio, and he entitled it De Divina Proporzione, the Divine Proportion. There is written evidence from the period which seemingly confirms that not only were Bellini and Pacioli known to each other, but that Bellini, his brother Gentile, and Pacioli met and collaborated over their various common interests. Of course, there's a lot more to it than this. So if you're interested further, why not go to my website, read the essay, or even better, book me to present the lecture go to www.gfwessaysandlectures.co.uk